Uh, let me welcome you this evening uh, in India. It's evening, uh, but for the uh, for people who are uh, less, who have uh, joined this meeting and to listen to Dr. Cliff Zingtraff, I believe I'm I'm, I'm not mis I'm mispronouncing his name, uh, so forgive me if I did that. Uh, uh, yeah. So. Uh, this is an this is part of an initiative which uh, uh, the uh, Impact and Policy Research Institute in New Delhi has begun um, on the state of education, and uh, this what this is what they call is uh, uh, the education dialogue, and we are privileged this evening to 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 have uh, Dr. Cliff Zingtraff, who is uh, Chief Learning Officer of the San Antonio Museum of uh, Science and Technology, SAMSAT. And he would be speaking on making STEM cities, education ideas and strategies for policymakers to his students. Uh, I am quite excited uh, because, you know, he's going to bring about uh, his experiences uh, in the field of education using uh, 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 with the input of technology and uh, how to make uh, the learning process a little more exciting uh, for school students as well as for university education. Uh, uh, Dr. Zingtraff has been uh, has been building up partnerships uh, across various sectors and with different um, initiatives that he has established with local and city-wise organizations. Uh, so I believe you know, his, the, the, the kind of narratives that he is going to present. And I'm quite excited looking, um, uh, listening to his, his narratives of how you know, the education or the educational scenario is likely to change particularly uh, with the with with technology coming in, um, and we are experiencing it globally uh, during this period of pandemic, when schools and colleges cannot meet uh, for a kind of a classroom interaction. So we one has to really look out for some other kinds of uh, avenues, and the avenues are too many. Uh, the point that uh, uh, I would be looking at uh, much more closely, and I believe I believe you know that would be interesting for several others uh, who are uh, attending the meeting this evening is to look at as to how uh, you know these initiatives could perhaps percolate down to a wider cross section of india's population if at all you know we adopt these experiences in our educational uh, processes in terms of uh, not only ideas not only philosophy uh, but also in terms of uh, implementing them uh, at, at the grassroots level. So uh, looking forward to uh, his presentation, Dr. Cliff, you know, the floor is yours. And uh, uh, so welcome, welcome once again. Thank you. And allow me one moment, everyone, to get my screen share moving. And if you could confirm for me that you see my screen. Yeah, we can see right. that. Yeah. yeah. All right, wonderful. Well, good evening to everyone. Uh, good morning to uh, anyone who might be joining from the United States. Uh, it's 9 a.m. here, a little after nine in the morning in San Antonio. Uh, it's my privilege to join. I wanna thank uh, Professor Singha. I hope I got your name right. Uh, you got mine perfectly. Well done, better than people in the United States, if I may add. And to Dr. Mehta, to Dr. Kumar, who I've met and uh, others, um, thank you for the privilege of presenting to you. Uh, I, I mentioned to them that there is no way that I'm going to present to an audience in India after his, an historic week in the United States without mentioning our election. Um, I, I am representing SAMSAT and we'll note we have a diversity of political views at SAMSAT, uh, but from my personal perspective, way to go Kamala. And, and I know she inspired so many people with her, her speech uh, the night the election was called, uh, including me, uh, noting that I, I may not look exactly like her or have her background, but I deeply appreciate it. And, 
And so it's my honor then to be speaking with you uh, so soon afterwards. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the idea of making STEM cities. And, and this idea uh, has to do with how you take all the resources of a city and bring them together to create great STEM learning experiences for students. Uh, I am gonna come at it uh, from a perspective of thinking about it all the way from policymakers down to students. And I wanna note this picture that I put on the first screen. Uh, a lot of my background is in secondary education. However, I've done plenty of work uh, with university staff and professors. Uh, I was at the University of Texas at Austin for 10 years myself. And this picture is a combination of university professors and secondary teachers working on STEM programs in Medellin, Colombia, which happens to be the 2012 Citibank Wall Street Journal Innovative City of the Year because of the way they work cross sector and how they have changed the narrative of a city that used to be the most dangerous in the world. And, and so I share this picture, uh, not necessarily to share every detail, but to set the tone for what I'm gonna talk about. It is a picture that very much represents the ideas uh, that are coming. So what I'm gonna do in the next 15 minutes or so, uh, I'm gonna hit three topics. Uh, the first I'm calling vision because I'm gonna share a program with you that I think is a great vision for anyone who is trying to build STEM programs in a city or region to aim at. But when you see it, you will also realize the challenges of resources and scale that are there. And so I will then spend a little bit of time talking about the problems that emerge from the first program and a little bit about how you might think about alignment all the way from your policymakers down to your teachers and students. And this is from a publication uh, of mine that is coming out in about two or three weeks. Uh, I've been working on it far too long, uh, but it is uh, about to be published and I think very relevant to the topic uh, at hand and the challenges uh, that you all have as you bring, try to build STEM programs in India. And then I'm gonna close very briefly with the power of partnerships. Uh, this, this will come from a book that I recently was the lead editor on called STEM in the Technopolis. I'll share just a few ideas from that and, and then uh, wrap up uh, with some thoughts about where you might take things. So setting a vision. This is from the website of the SA SMART program in San Antonio. Uh, SA stands for San Antonio. SA SMART is the mayor's K-12 smart city challenge. This is another India connection for me. I must mention it. This program was born in a hotel room in Delhi. It was born the day that our country pulled out of the climate agreement and inspired me to think about how we might solve the challenges of our city. Uh, I had uh, had the privilege of working with a council person, uh, not the mayor of our city, but the next level. Uh, that gentleman was two weeks away from being elected mayor himself. Uh, his name's Ron Nuremberg. You can see his picture here. Uh, the Honorable Mayor Nuremberg uh, responded to my email from a Delhi hotel room and liked the idea of building a challenge, uh, building a program around the challenges of cities that would be from, for middle and high school students. And so we started the SA SMART program. Now, rather than give you uh, too much more verbal description, uh, I want to, well, actually I do have one slide of verbal description. So let me just very briefly walk you through, uh, you know, the calendar for this program. We do an announcement of a topic in the fall. Uh, we've done this for three years. Our topics have been transportation, sustainability, and digital inclusion. In January, we run a clinic for students. Between February and May, those students do research and we mentor them with adult, profession, uh, adult professionals delivering mentorship. And in May, they deliver final presentations as part of a competition. This program is for grades seven to 12. The teams are four to six students each. And in selected schools, entire grades or programs adopt the, they bring the program in as part of their instruction during the day. We have one school uh, that had about 120 students, another school that had about 110 students that were working on this program, uh, aligned to some of the things they were already working on in the school. Uh, 
Now, I'm gonna do the rest of this uh, talking about this program with pictures. So this is from the competition clinic. You can see all the students sitting in the audience. Uh, the two ladies that you see here in the audience, uh, this is uh, Jordana, Jordana Barton. She works for the United States Federal Reserve uh, who watches over our banking system. And this is uh, Candy Mendoza or Candelaria Mendoza. Uh, she is a local advocate in digital inclusion and a professional herself uh, work, uh, working uh, in, I believe, the city now, uh, addressing many of the challenges that our city has in bringing digital inclusion and other services. And so we, had, we shared with these students ideas about uh, city challenges, about how to do technical and market research. And these two ladies shared their knowledge of digital inclusion, something that they were all working on as part of the Digital Inclusion Alliance of San Antonio. During that clinic, we brought in industry professionals and other, uh, and when I say industry, I really mean employers, uh, those working in industry, working in government, uh, who are addressing it, either this challenge or were innovators and entrepreneurs themselves. They worked with our middle and high school students as they were beginning to take on the problem, as they were thinking about ways they might address the problem of digital inclusion in San Antonio. During the next few months, we continued to mentor these students uh, you may not recognize her, but this is Candy Mendoza again. She served as a mentor for this team who created this presentation that you see. This is not her presentation. This is a presentation from the students who have been working on how to provide internet to people in San Antonio. They were showing her the presentation. She was giving them their feedback and they would go back and iterate on this presentation and would do very well in the final competition. Uh, this is a picture, not from this year, unfortunately, because our presentations were virtual, but from the year prior. Uh, these students are at the San Antonio Museum of Science and Technology, or SAMSAT, and this student is presenting the technical analysis slide. Now, while I might advise this student to use less words on his slide, I will point you to the fact that this is a seventh grader who is drawing graphs, is drawing charts, and is explaining these things to an adult audience. These two gentlemen, this uh, gentleman, Brian Dillard, is the chief innovation officer for the city of San Antonio. And this gentleman is Charles Woodson, the CEO of our main incubator in San Antonio, Geekdom, known as Geekdom, which I think is a great name. This is a close up of the poster of one of the teams. Uh, I wanted to show you this uh, for a number of reasons. One, I wanted you to see the categories of things they covered in their presentation. Uh, there was a problem they were chasing, a solution they proposed, they provided a rationale for their solution, explained how it worked, researched it technically, did market research, went out and talked to people and then finally a recommend, a made a recommendation and described next steps. I hope you all can appreciate the interdisciplinary nature of these students going through this program and the need for them to pull many elements together and to work as a team. Uh, we talk so much about the importance of teamwork skills in the workforce. And this is something that we uh, embed very strongly in this program. Now you may recognize Mayor Nuremberg being back in our picture. This is so powerful to have the mayor of the city show up and he went around and talked to each team. He interacted with the teams. He heard their explanations of the, of the specific problems that they chased in our city, the solutions. He took three of their solutions back to the city staff, to, to the staff that works for him and, uh, and, and staff in the city in order to encourage them to think about the solutions that these students have proposed. And finally, this is a competition. Uh, you can see in this top picture, uh, Mayor Nuremberg right in the middle of all the finalists uh, in this competition. Uh, below is a picture from uh, the second year of our competition as well. So, 
What are some themes that you just saw? Well, the first is we had these students working on real problems. And I would encourage you not to underestimate the, the motivational power of having students work on problems that they find relevant. This last year, they were working on digital inclusion problems in the middle of a pandemic when all of these students are many, most actually, the vast majority have been forced to do schooling from home. Uh, Cross-sector partnerships. You will notice we had government involved. We had industry and other employers involved. I work for a nonprofit. We had the universities involved. Number three, this was not just about inspiring students and getting them excited. We taught them research skills. You could see from that slide that students had to apply mathematics in order to do some of their analysis. But beyond the technical side, we also did uh, drove the students to do market research. Um, what many of you will probably relate to the idea that just because something can be done technically and it's an exciting to a scientist does not mean that the market will accept it. And so we encourage these students to think about the market. The program is interdisciplinary in integrated STEM, civics. Uh, they were forced to learn how to communicate their ideas to take feedback. As you can see, the program had serious leadership support from the mayor, from other leaders in our city. And then finally, you noted that there were many youth adult interactions in the program. Uh, the role of the teacher, by the way, was a facilitator of this experience. And this is something that I studied in my doctoral dissertation, how teachers view the role of volunteers and mentors who are coming into their programs. And most teachers viewed that, viewed themselves as facilitators of an experience, bringing in adults that they wanted to interact with those students and allow those students to gain the benefit of those interactions. Now, I already mentioned that it's one thing to have a program like this and it's another thing to bring a program to scale. And I have to believe that many of you are watching this and you're asking the question, can this be scaled? What would it take to scale this? What issues emerge if one were to bring this program to high scale? And here are the issues that I see. The first is teacher training. For a program like this to be delivered, teachers need to understand the goals of the program. They need to be comfortable with not lecture-based pedagogy, but with project-based learning type pedagogy. That is often something that requires an adjustment of teachers. Many of the teachers who come into our program today uh, either do this already or are, have a natural aptitude for this type of instruction. But to bring it to scale, it is necessary to deliver training to teachers. Number two, resources. You will see that these students needed devices in order to do their research. They needed to be able to move around town. And, and therefore, those res uh, to deliver those resources is very important. The role of administrators cannot be underestimated. Those had, uh, the, the role of administrators to support the teachers in their schools it is one thing as a teacher to be working on these uh, programs when you have support from administration, another one not. I also know that all of you deal with education standards, you deal with testing and accountability. And for these types of programs to be successful, there needs to be some amount of alignment between those. In fact, I would argue to you that it is the lack of alignment in programs like these that is the major challenge for scaling and bringing them into alignment is the main task. Uh, Dr. Mehta, if I may, I see that you have appeared. Um, let me ask you about time real quick. How am I doing on time? You're doing well, Cliff. Yes, okay, uh, very you, you have some more time, uh, 10, okay. five, 10 minutes, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I think I'll need five or a few more, very good. So, sure, sure. talking about scale, what I would like to do is introduce you to a framework in an academic publication that I will be releasing uh, with my co-author at Susi Harumi uh, within the next few weeks. It is called 
aligning learner-centered design, philosophy, theory, research, and practice. And it is centered around the framework that you see on your screen right now. Now that's a lot of words uh, in the article, but to think of it more simply, in school systems, you have people who carry certain philosophies about how instruction is delivered. You have instructional designers who try to bring that philosophy into practice. And then you have practitioners, you have people who work in the schools, both the administrators and the classroom teachers who must deliver the kinds of instruction, uh, kinds of curriculum that are given to them. And I see so many examples of well-designed programs that are put into school settings that are very traditional in nature. And those programs are generally not successful. And the reason is you do not have alignment. You have a school culture trying to move in a traditional direction and you have teachers with individual programs trying to move in a different direction. And I would strongly encourage, I understand uh, many of those who will see this are policymakers. And I strongly encourage you to think about this problem of alignment and about how you hit the top of the curve in programs. And, and I wanna just so obviously don't have time to go through this framework, but I just wanna point out some main elements. Here is philosophy, which encapsulates everything that happens. Here are some theories, and these theories will be familiar to you who are academics or teachers, constructionism, uh, constructivism, situated learning, uh, pedagogies that are not about lecture, but that are about engaging students in problems, engaging them in projects. Here is a place that I want to emphasize. There are strategies that one can use to design curriculum units, full units, multiple sessions over entire semesters or years. And these can be done, they're harder and they require a school to be more advanced in terms of being able to take on uh, constructivist type curriculum. But then there are also tactics that individual can, teachers can use in their classrooms. For example, reflection. I can be a teacher in a traditional school, yet I can carve out 10 or 15 minutes of a class to ask students to reflect on something that they've been told or I can ask them to discuss a problem. I can pose a problem to them. And my main point here is that regardless of where you are, whether you're a teacher in a traditional classroom, whether you're an administrator in a traditional setting, there are things that you can do to advance constructivist learning and teaching in a way that aligns sufficiently with your setting to move that forward. And I wanna strongly encourage all of you to think in those terms, to think about how you achieve alignment because even though you might make some compromises in a program like SA Smart, you will achieve more ultimately and push the ball forward more and maybe build communities that now get the power of what you're trying to do and next year we'll take it to an even higher level. So my takeaways from this for you are that instructional designers must account for classroom concerns and teacher beliefs. The classroom teachers must understand the intent of the things they're being given. Administrators set the culture. And if you don't have alignment, you're never gonna scale. So you need to align. Very briefly, I recently published a book called STEM in the Technopolis, The Power of STEM Education and Regional Technology Policy. This book is available from Springer and it talks about many of the, uh, the ideas that I've shared. Uh, if you look at the principles, it thinks about the idea of looking at the industry clusters and the challenges in your city that are most important to where you are, not to us, not to San Antonio, not to a city in the United States, but to a city in, in India and specifically yours, to think about how that can be used as a challenge for students. Using STEM pedagogy, which throws open the door of school, the door of schools, to working with partners, to working with, with uh, mentors, people from industry. Uh, that model, government, industry, academia, secondary and primary schools, what we call K-12 in the United States, and nonprofits. In the middle of this, you need to think hard about how to get, deliver an equitable experience, and you need to measure it. Measurement is harder in STEM-based programs. It's not a test with check boxes. It is harder to do and thinking about measurement is important. You can see some of the cases 
for example, the Medellin case that are listed here on the bottom of the screen. Something I will offer to you all that I don't have time in 20 or so minutes to explain is the tools that are available in the book and in the article. And something I am going to offer to you all, if there is interest, I would be happy to do a one hour follow-up session. Would be happy to work with Empry or other partners in doing that to talk through the tools that are available for thinking about who the partners are, thinking about the framework in your setting, thinking about how to identify the drivers in your city. These are things that I would love to do with you and would be happy to do if there is demand to do it. Uh, most of the, mostly though, I encourage you to take the ideas and experience, put your team together and go chase it. This picture is from the Gandhi Museum in Delhi, which I have visited, uh, not the museum 12 times, but I've been to Delhi 12 times. I've been to the museum two or three. It's one of my favorite places in Delhi. And if you have a group of committed followers with you, a committed team to put this in place, it can be small, but find a place to start and think about how you make that happen in your setting. Uh, it's been uh, my privilege to share this information with you and uh, I'm now happy to uh, participate in additional discussion and answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Cliff, uh, for your very lucid and uh, pointed presentation. I think, you know, it was uh, very beneficial for some of us uh, for having uh, pointed out that. And what I really like the most is that, you know, when you were really talking about a scale. Uh, and this is what really matters in the Indian context, in the Indian educational scenario, where, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, a kind of an educational structure, which in fact is so iniquitous by its very design uh, that, you know, it uh, really uh, serves different classes and different groups of people in spite of the fact that they could, it could be really being, uh, it, it could be conducted within a single, uh, uh, what you can call uh, uh, educational board or examination boards, but yet, you know, it could be, uh, it is so diverse. And uh, uh, the kind of a clientele of students whom we really address are uh, so disparate, you know, so, uh, so therefore, you know, you have the scale issue, which, I believe is, is, is very, very important. And uh, I see the potential <clears throat> that, you know, when you really organize things, keeping in mind that there is a school and there are students in a particular school, uh, where school itself becomes, I mean, we don't have a school districts uh, in cities we have, but, you know, we keep flouting all kinds of uh, structures, uh, but we don't have that kind of a school districts in the rural areas, right? Um, um, and so therefore, uh, if we could perhaps situate uh, this kind of a pedagogical innovation that you were really putting in uh, at, the, at, the, at the school level itself, where school becomes the first eye and we build up communities around it, uh, which in fact participates at various levels in creating um, the kind of a STEM-based kind of a pedagogy, which would be extremely important. The second important point, you know, which you really made was the lack of alignment. Yes, uh, I believe, you know, this is this is where we all go. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in, in the Indian context, you know, there is absolutely no no connection between what the the lack of alignment is between the very idea uh, sometimes that you know education is so external to um, say the cultural values that people may have. So school mm -hmm. exists independent of uh, the cultural value. The employment is the motto. I mean, uh, it's not that, you know, we're re really going to contribute something. It's going to be the source of income, which of course is also important. Otherwise, why should we, we be spending so many years in the schools and colleges? Uh, but this lack of alignment is more significant between the administrators, teachers, and the community. You know, the three exist at three different levels. So that's where, you know, we got to bring them together. And 
could really pull them together. Uh, could it be industry, the local industry, the local mentors, how it will happen? Our new education policy is also trying to bring in some of those elements. But, uh, you know, this is something, you know, which we really need to explore and uh, maybe uh, take up case studies and introduce some of these ideas that you really talked about um, at three different levels, you know, in, in the most ex uh, excluded areas, you know, where schools could be absolutely low in terms of budget and so on and so forth. So we'll have to innovate ways in which without the digital technology, maybe, you know, we, we could still use our imagination. Um, and also in urban areas and somewhere in the middle ranking cities and rural areas where some of these uh, uh, could be experimented. Uh, you are absolutely right that, you know, it's a problem orientation and problem solution, which in fact is, is at the core of it. And that's where, you know, uh, we got to uh, uh, put in our mind. Um, students must be oriented towards providing a solution. I mean, they're, they're, they're too, they're, there's so much of problems they are being fed. You know, this is what is happening with the population. This is what is happening with, with the resources. This is what is happening with our, with, our, with our environment, but very little in terms of solutions that they get. And they do not get to really experiment those ideas. Taking them out of the classroom is something, you know, which, which really needs to be uh, needs to be encouraged. And there the role of uh, the, the administrators becomes very important. Um, the role of motivated teachers becomes very important. I can bring in, uh, uh, I'll say very briefly, uh, the element of uh, what we really introduced after the RTE or as part of the Sarv Shikshavyan, what we call education for all strategies that we adopted after 2000 or 2004 to be, or 2002 to be more precisely, where we, uh, in India, we created various hierarchies of uh, uh, centers where teachers could interact within, that means the peer group interaction is encouraged. Uh, but um, we really don't have very good studies as to what were what, what the, what the, what the outcomes of these peer group interaction. But, it's certainly very important that wherever the, the teachers as peers interact in a particular locality, keeping students in mind as to what are their learning abilities. I mean, ch children have all kinds of abilities. They're not deprived of it. It's just that, you know, we got to really explore those abilities. And uh, once, you know, the teachers are in a position to interact with their peers, come up with solutions, come up with the strategies which they can experiment both in the classrooms and outside the classroom. Uh, such freedom, uh, whether the educational structure in, given educational structure in our country in India, uh, particularly, and uh, uh, would be in a position to provide something which we really need to keep in mind. Uh, so I think, you know, it was a very comprehensive presentation uh, ideas are too many, and I believe you know those who are attending um, uh, the the, uh, the meeting this evening would have quite a few questions uh, that Cliff could perhaps uh, answer. Uh, so the floor is open for questions, um, and I believe you know we have how much of time, uh, Arjun, Simi? Sir, we have uh, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, we, we have plenty of time to take in questions and. Uh, Sir, let me let me only yeah. start with yeah. a very uh, yeah. generic sort of question, and uh, which is really uh, related from a, a personal level. That uh, uh, doing so, we, we all know that uh, during the course of our studies and what we want to do and where we want to be, especially in the schools when where there is so much of competition, uh, what is the incentive uh, uh, which students should have or should know? or even the parents should know, or teachers, administrators, practitioners, or policy makers, uh, towards highlighting uh, the, the, the STEM practices. And uh, of course, there is a trade-off of timing, and which requires a lot of self-motivation, and, uh, and also support, I would say, ecosystem and emotional support, uh, also harnessing this tech. So in, in, in your uh, analysis, what should be the way forward on a very personal level, but also at an institutional level, because uh, uh, also uh, in my thinking, the rate of failure is quite high. 
uh, doing something, you know, going into this competitive and uh, experimenting. So, uh, what do you would you like to tell you uh, to all the relevant stakeholders to how to approach this and what should be uh, the the motivational points uh, which one should uh, uh, follow through? Yes, uh, Doctor Cliff. Sure. The uh... Well, you, I'm going to start with your comment. The failure rate is high. Uh, that that's true in any entrepreneurial venture, of which I would consider this to be one. Right? It may not be a company of its own. Uh, you know, it's uh, maybe another way to call it is intrapreneurship. You know, doing entrepreneurship inside of an organization. Uh, I, I would argue that much will be learned in the process. Oftentimes, efforts like these don't survive in the original uh, visionary form, but elements survive. I'll tell you the analogy I would make there. Uh, I'm at my PhD is in educational technology. There are thousands of experiments going on right now in the use of educational technology that people like me have wanted to try for 20 years. And they're being done now because there's a pandemic and we have no choice. They have to be tried. I believe that most of these experiments will not continue, but the ones that work well will, and they will be integrated into a larger system. And so I would encourage anyone who is concerned about failure to not necessarily think about whether the program will survive, but how their system will be improved and the things that will survive out of it, how this pedagogy might be integrated. Um, as it relates to personal motivation. And I think, I think where you're going with that, uh, you know, in throughout the world, there's much emphasis placed on taking and passing tests that give you admission into different institutions. Uh, that, you know, my knowledge of it in India is that it is very high, uh, you know, and it is that it's certainly high as well in the United States. It's a point of major debate hear, you know, how our schools teach and the degree to which they, they count on a test. I think, I think what I would say, I, so in terms of alignment, you know, there's an alignment lesson here, which is that I would not, uh, you know, there's a grand policy issue of whether there should be less testing. M most people on this call probably cannot affect that other than adding their voice. Um, maybe there are some on the call who can affect it, and I'd strongly encourage you all to think about whether the extreme testing is really uh, productive. But um, from a personal standpoint, you may pass a test, but when you land in the workplace, and after two or three years, actually after six months, no one cares anymore whether you pass the test. What they care about is whether you are a productive employee. Mm -hmm. What you're going to care about is whether you are in a job that contributes to your financial security and after that is rewarding, if possible. And engaging in these kinds of programs far more prepares you for the workplace you are going to land in than passing a test does. I would also briefly mention the idea of fit. Uh, many people... Uh, I, I do, well, I am not going to uh, do anything to discourage someone from getting into the best institution we can. I strongly encourage that. But uh, the idea of fit is also important. And, you know, I know many people, uh, many people that are um, friends and colleagues of mine who didn't necessarily go to the best school, but put themselves in a very good position. They put themselves in a place that they're good at, they care about, and they've seen their career go higher as a result of that, because eventually the lack of going to the right school didn't matter. People recognized their, their abilities for what they were. Um, I, I'll make one last comment from an institutional standpoint. I see um, preparing citizens to live in a democracy versus preparing them for the workplace that's a choice. I don't see that. That's a false choice, in my opinion, because done right, designed properly, those two goals complement 
one another. Just think about the students going through the SA SMART program. <laughs> they are being prepared to live in a democracy, to understand its challenges, and to apply what they've learned academically. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yes. Yeah, Yes, no way, yes. Uh, Simi, would you like to uh, yeah. make some observations, some questions? I I have one small follow-up question. Yeah. Yes, just, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. just for the flow. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, Dr. Cliff, uh, thank you. Uh, just two follow-up points that, you know, how then if someone in someone's mind it comes that then how it is uh, sort of very different from a skilling program or let us say like the polytechnics we have. And uh, th that is also one choice, you know, which is coming. I would uh, also add here since, you know, these things are going on. Uh, if let us say someone is trying to dwell into knowledge of any kind, which is not very popular, or I would say uh, they are not very accessi accessible to in their neighborhood per se, or the, in their district, uh, where should they look forward to in terms of knowledge or having access to some sort of mentorship for this sort of innovation and the sort of study one is looking forward to uh, for student teachers and also administrators. Uh, Dr. Cliff, if you know, if yes, you, if you like to, yes, add for the interest. Yeah, on, on the first question, there's clearly overlap with the polytechnics in this kind of approach. They more naturally use project-based learning and those sorts of things. I work with the, the equivalent of polytechnics here and I can tell you that not all of them fully embrace that pedagogy. They still look a lot like lecture classes. You still have a lot of people come out of those programs who don't understand how the workplace works. They have not had the four C's, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity developed in them. I think there's room for improvement. Uh, your second question about mentoring, um, I'm not sure I completely understood it. Uh, yes. I will tell you that mentoring is really important. Let me yes add Dr. Kli. I just I just added that if let us say someone is in uh, let us say southern part of India in some remote village or cities, where should they look forward to in terms if they are trying to do this, uh, look forward to this. So let us say someone is looking into vacuum cleaning of roads as a you know STEM mm -hmm. city practice. Uh, where should right. they refer to? to gain the knowledge or to gain the mentorship, the right platforms in your view? Well, uh, you know, my short answer to that is I'm not qualified to answer that question because I don't live there. And I, and I would point back to the idea of adopting the, chat, the, the priorities and challenges of the places they live. Uh, I tend to say cities because that's what I study. But uh, if it's in a rural area, uh, I, you know, if I were going into a rural area, I would look around and say, what are the challenges here? What are the... what? Where are the industries? Is it farming? Is it, you know, and, and use that as the challenge. And then when you do that, you have a natural fit of, of uh, the topics being studied to the available resources in the area. That, that's my short answer. My longer one would be, I, um, uh, I, I guess, talk to the folks who are local. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you because, and uh, uh, I think, you know, the, uh, that's why I was talking about uh, forming school-based communities. I mean, so whether even urban or rural areas, let them go around, let give them the freedom to in fact identify the problems and with whatever resources, yes. both uh, the financial and the human resources or uh, resources of any other kind from the industry or wherever. Uh, and we have experiences of this kind, but the only problem is that, you know, we have not have had a very sustained kind of an engagement of this kind. I mean, you, we started as, as a kind of a mission for a few years, and then, you know, this team gets way, gives way to something, you know, which becomes a kind of a routine matter. Uh, but, you know, the emphasis is not so much, I believe, I mean, to my understanding, is to make them understand the, the, the workplace culture, because the workplace culture could also undergo a change if, you know, through this STEM technology, students are exposed to alternatives of how things can be done, you know, yes. because that, that is where they would be in a position to really create new innovations, you know. And, but the only problem that I see is, not the only, but there are many, in Indian context, you know, uh, there are layers and layers of problems. One problem that I see is that, you know, whenever, 
you know, the curriculum, uh, perhaps, you know, it's also, it had also started happening in, in the United States. Uh, but in India, curriculum is always one of the central part of the debate. What it really means, you know, and, and then there are political sides of it, you know, so yes. uh, when, you, when, you, when you talk about women's participation in work, you know, so there are, there are going to be different kinds of positions which will be taken in, okay, we should be teaching this and not that, you know, so why should these students be exposed to this idea? So, so the question is that if we really want to create a kind of an equitable society, which ultimately is the goal, you know, uh, and a sustainable society. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the school and the administrators uh, in the schools will have to be given uh, some kind of a freedom, some kind of an autonomy, autonomy with accountability, right? You know, there should be, there should be no lack of accountability. Uh, they should, but they should always be given this autonomy. And wherever you have this autonomy, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in one of the, villages which is uh, where you have a school which is doing pretty well working among the among the tribal children you know uh, uh, you know the, the children are doing pretty good i mean and they are all very happy and they're learning the skills uh, to lead their lives and their uh, their livelihood doesn't mean that you know they are going to be situated or uh, put into a kind of a context you know where they would never be in a position to uh, move out to the urban areas uh, so it depends upon how much they are in a position to inculcate and how they break uh, uh, through the chains and the structural um, uh, uh, obstructions which are there. So I believe, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 I mean, there are many such dimensions, but I would also like to have uh, other participants like Simi and of course Simi is one of the organizers and others to in fact, uh, Ask, if uh, I may, yeah. uh, may I may I transition to Simi? Yeah. Uh, because there are like 20 things I wanted to say in the middle of that. I'm going to keep it to one. In yeah. San Antonio, our priority, uh, one of our programs is around cybersecurity. Why? Because we have the second highest number of certified information security professionals in the nation, the headquarters for the U.S. Air Force Cybersecurity Command, and defense contractors everywhere. Now, that's not going to work in a rural area, but you find something as important to cy as important to that rural area as cybersecurity is to us, that is how you build sustainment in these programs, because the community will care deeply about their success and will show up and help. Uh, yeah. yeah. Dr. Dr. Simi. <laughs> thank you sure. for thank you. a 30-second <laughs> invasion you very much. of your time. Thank you very much for not at all, no problem. It was actually uh, an uh, intervention which uh, perhaps would be repeated if if it may be. Thank you very much, Professor Sachidanand Sinha. And uh, much of my question or comments are um, something uh, in, include something that you have already touched upon. And uh, thank you very much, Cliff. Um, I congratulate you for making such a wonderful, elaborate, and precise um, uh, lecture. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, the slide uh, that you showed on the seventh grader um, presenting and also on the next slide with the young students uh, doing the teamwork, exploring uh, through scientific solutions to city challenges was simply very, very uh, inspiring. Um, you know, uh, the the entire creativity and innovativeness would perhaps of the students would perhaps not remain uh, unearthed uh, should it not have been uh, uh, for the support from their parents, from their teachers, as well as from the administrators, as you just uh, mentioned, that uh, the mayor personally visited each of these groups and then even took three lessons to his office and then uh, perhaps uh, maybe uh, is mulling over it or even implementing the solutions. Uh, so uh, it is so important to channelize the uh, bright young minds towards positive and constructive uh, directions uh, given, the, given the entire frame of society, our society, uh, which is in. Um, 
Unfortunately, you have uh, transitioned to a new form of uh, uh, governance. Um, you will be soon transitioning to in in January, uh, with with good good effects. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, so when we uh, when you talk about the problem of uh, alignment, you know it is important to design a curriculum, uh, and that too very intelligently. Uh, in fact, much of the creativity-led initiatives in India, uh, in the Indian school system, so to say, is kept as extracurricular activities. You know, uh, apart from the general uh, physics, chemistry, maths, English, uh, and other uh, other subjects. No, what they so, call is a socially creative something like that. Socially useful and creative something. S U D something like that. S U P W yes. S U P W which in fact remains yes. absolutely neglected. It only yes, happens yes. when the examination is going to come. <laughs> yeah, and and it is just graded. You know, yeah, uh, I did not know what I participated in, and I got an A. So, uh, what was it, or whether it was just it is actually a neglected uh, field. So, um, um, this was my. Uh, observation what according to you my question is um, how important is the linguistic adjustments to stem education which country you have worked with several countries uh, around the world uh, which country in your working experience um, having a non english speaking population uh, done really well in making stem cities or even in even in progressing towards making uh, stem cities uh, I ask this because we are a non-English speaking population and we would not want another level of inequality being created, which Professor Sinha uh, mentioned um, uh, just, just now uh, about the inequities uh, and, and, in, and uh, avoid giving or avoid instilling a sense of elitism uh, with STEM education, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis other students. So basically, creating a new section of haves and have-nots among the uh, among the students. So, uh, if you recall, in the American Center, when we had your um, discussion on on the master class, uh, whether you like it or not, the students who participated came from elite schools, from the affluent families. Uh, so, uh, there is certainly a, a challenge. So, uh, what are your views on the on these? And um, I would just like to end with uh, uh, with the um, uh, fact that we have Atal Tinkering Labs in India in the in the school curriculum, as Sir also mentioned about the Atal Innovation Mission, which was recently launched by the government of India. Um, uh, we are not very sure how things are happening. We did a small study, and uh, it was really uh, very inspiring, encouraging. But again, the participation of girls uh, in the STEM education or in these uh, adult tinkering labs uh, remained, remained limited. So there are multiple challenges because we would definitely want some, some sort of a model uh, of SAMSAT, the things happening there to inculcate creativity uh, also to happen in India and also uh, have a whole generation of uh, wonderful young talents coming up. But uh, these are some of the uh, issues that needs to be kept in mind. So if you'd like to comment on these points. Thank you again, Cliff. Yeah, be glad, be glad to do that. Uh, the first thing I, I think I want to share is where SAMSAT is located in San Antonio. Uh, San Antonio is very much uh, north side, more wealthy. Uh, the south side of the of uh, the city, uh, less wealthy, and there's some small there's some finer points in that that uh, probably don't have time to go through right now, but that's the basic um, geography of the city. Uh, and we actually talked in our in our short uh, meeting before we started that a local professor, uh, I, I just have to admit it's a bit of an aside, but a local professor did a study looking back a hundred years of some of the racial uh, and, and socioeconomic lines that were drawn in our city and how today's school districts, school district is how we govern schools in the United States, how the 19 school districts in San Antonio, by the way, we are 1.5 million. We're a little tiny compared to India. Our 1.5 million people, we have 19 different school districts that govern that and they line up on 
it's it's amazing and and sadly amazing how those school districts line up along these these historic lines and just how deeply rooted our issues of equality are. Uh, San Antonio, by the way, um, doing very well as a whole, but top five in economic segregation in the United States by multiple measures. Okay, so we have that issue here. SAMSAT is on the south side of our city. We're actually on an Air Force base that closed, but that is governed by a redevelopment board. And much of the immediate community are some of the most economically segregated and, and challenged in our city. So what we are doing is building programs and working out and, and intentionally reaching out to those school districts first. So when we go after grant funding, we raise money. Uh, what we are typically doing is going to those uh, districts in our immediate area and using and using those first uh, to bring in students. And I think this is one strategy that you can use to make sure that these programs are not solely uh, aligned. Uh, certainly in the design as well. I think as you design these programs, you need to keep in mind the population you're serving uh, along many attributes and make sure that they're des uh, designed in a way. I think some of the ideas that I've shared about focusing on local priorities apply. Um, you know, we can even focus on local priorities in our immediate area. Uh, now, Dr. Simi, you asked me about a, another um, city, not in the United States, that is not English speaking, that I think is doing a really good job of this. And, and Medellin, Colombia is the one that comes to mind immediately. Uh, I, I, now I wish I had included a picture um, from some of my first visits to Medellin uh, when I um, when I first went to Medellin and I was going through a, a toll on the way from the airport, going through a toll booth, there was a sticker that said, Medellin la mas educada, which in Spanish means the most, in English means the most educated. Medellin created an agency called Ruta NA, stands for Route North. It's on their north side that they're economically challenged. And they put city development, the recruit of, recruiting of big companies, the development of small companies, city planning, and STEM education under the same roof and had all of these people sit at the same table once a week talking to each other, thinking about how to develop a knowledge-based economy. And that's why Citibank and the Wall Street Journal named them the most innovative city of the year globally in 2012. It is why the Latin American hub for the fourth industrial revolution, the global organization is headquartered in Medellin. And so they have done a spectacular job and they're doing this by gathering all the sectors together. They have created a specific organization for teachers. They have gone out and looked for Spanish-based curriculum and they have adapted to their local needs and setting. And, and so I have no doubt that this can be done. It, it's not, you know, I understand that there's a lot of resources that are in English that are not necessarily transferable into a community where English is not the main language. But again, if you think about what local resources are available and alignment and creativity and designing things in a way that you don't count on having lots of um, expensive resources available, I think these things can be, can be done. I could certainly spend more time on, on that, um, but in the interest of time, I'll just say for uh, in the topic of female participation, one strategy uh, in the United States has been to form all girl teams. So that, I mean, there's a, you can see pros and cons of that. You don't want to isolate uh, females, but a lot of times if there are cultural issues with uh, females being able to take the lead, take leadership roles in teams, you can do that by having them make an all girls team. This happens a lot in our robotics competitions. You have many all girls teams. And I would say, don't tell the girls who are students what topic to study, give them a voice. Let the girls pick the STEM topic they wanna to study. And I think they would find that motivational and you might find your participation rates upticking a little bit. And I'll stop there. 
Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cliff. Um, Professor uh, Sinha, uh, we have uh, with us uh, Mr. Samir Onhale and uh, Cliff. Dr. Cliff, I would request you to spare some more, just some more time to uh, listen to what uh, Mr. Samir Onhale has to say. He is the um, Joint Commissioner uh, from the state of Maharashtra and uh, he was previously the um, Smart City CEO uh, of Thane Smart City. So if uh, that is okay with you, I would like, I would love, love to invite uh, Mr. Samir Unhali to make his comments. Absolutely. Yeah, Samir, so, uh, are you here? Very, uh, yeah. very good evening. If you could uh, actually, I'm turn traveling, on my video. Uh, that's what, I'm traveling okay. actually, so you know, I might not be, my network might have some problems. Sure. And okay. yet I, try, I strained my ears to hear and it was extremely delightful the very idea of making STEM cities, especially for someone like me who is working with the cities. And uh, Dr. Cliff must be uh, thanked for his wonderful <coughs> exposition of the very idea that some city can be developed on the STEM lines. It was new for us. Uh, I think I was also very interested in this idea of district uh, education districts that United States have. Uh, currently, uh, the uh, edu administration of education in Indian cities or even rural areas for that matter is done through local bodies, <clears throat> but the uh, community engagement and participation in the, uh, the, the conducting of education is very less. Of course, we do have this parents, teachers, organizations, but the gamut uh, which uh, uh, Dr. Cliff mentioned, that actually uh, need it as a good idea for us to really emulate you know that we should really think of some uh, exclusively district uh, education uh, boards or educational uh, uh, institutions which will have community engagement. Uh, uh, working with the cities, I do have some reservations from the electoral and political form format of the organizations for management of uh, education. Uh, we might have electoral politics there, but we may not have community engagement. So the idea of district education districts is a good idea that should be tried. Next, I think the, <clears throat> there have been many uh, single uh, examples there on STEM. In fact, under Smart City, we had tried to get in a robotics uh, sort of uh, session on all the uh, municipal schools. As we know, municipal schools are in the poorest localities. And that was one excellent we tried. But uh, as we keep on saying, uh, the size of India is such that a small experiment somewhere being done uh, doesn't really makes an impact at national level. So we will have to think of you know how to uh, create an institutions which will at the same time have the discipline for effectiveness, yet the flexibility for creativity. I think you know that is uh, one dilemma that is uh, we have in the education and you know, administration of education at the city level. Uh, but, uh, lastly, I would like to just you know add that. Uh, under the, uh, as it was mentioned rightly by Dr. Simi, that the Atal Innovation, we have the Skill Development Council, we have uh, many new experiments being done, and probably we might require some time to gauge the effect it has, because, you know, the, the size of India is probably three continents put in together, and Indian population will be still more than that. So creating an impact and fast uh, and speedily into this huge geography and huge population will indeed be a challenge, but I must thank Dr. Cliff and also congratulate Impri for organizing this uh, very wonderful and very different uh, idea of making STEM cities. I hope I learn something and uh, I try to implement uh, in whatever small way I can. Uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Simi, and uh, thank you, Dr. Cliff, very much for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very Samir, much. Samir, thank sir, you. is now looking after around 400 cities in our biggest state of Maharashtra. So something, yes, we really look forward to how all those cities in Maharashtra state also develop this sort of uh, innovation for also solving the problem and you know also learning with the world. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, really thankful. Uh, Sachi sir, if you'd like to add anything. There is not much to add. I think yes, you know, if there are some more observations so we can if we have time, otherwise, you know, uh, I'll, I'll certainly thank uh, Cliff for his wonderful presentation. Uh, for me, it was extremely good because now I can associate so many things, you know, because I am a geographer and I work on for local communities. So basically for the marginalized 
people and I work in the area of education. So, you know, it's quite a bit of understanding that I have been in a position to develop um, uh, after you made your presentation. Um, another, just a small reference to the fact that- you know, Your camera is off, I guess. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay, okay. well, okay. yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, in India, you know, if you look at the, 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 the mac macro statistics that we have had, especially in the context of STEM, uh, nearly about 50 plus percentage, I mean, maybe it, it could be close to 55 percentage of our, our high schools and high secondary schools, they do not even have science or mathematics, you see. So that's the kind of a gap that we have, you know, and, uh, and there is a huge divide between the rural and the urban area. So, you know, and this is, this is what the government report has said, and this is part and parcel of a report which, which I authored. I mean, I, I, I wrote for the, for the parliamentarians, uh, which is there uh, with, the, with, the, with the present government, you know, uh, trying to look at as to what was the state of uh, government schools in India. And uh, half of these, they do not even have. I mean, this is where you have 55% of the schools, high schools, they do not have science uh, facilities for science education. And almost about 60% of them, they do not even have labs. So, I mean, there is very little possibility unless until we really move in a big way, developing uh, some kind of an infrastructure, uh, which really happened to some extent uh, as part of uh, the RTE uh, governance uh, framework, but but you know now that the government has in, incorporated uh, higher education and I mean secondary education also within the ambit of uh, RTE, but then you know the the goals of the RTE should not be lost uh, just because you know we want to expand the scope of it. There is a possibility that it may get diluted also. So with these uh, comments, I think you know. I would uh, thank Impri and Arjun, Simi, and everybody for giving me this opportunity of uh, listening to Cliff and great uh, Cliff uh, uh, for your excellent presentation. And I think, you know, I'll certainly uh, get hold of your book as soon as it comes, you know, so that, you know, I write back to you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, I sir. Uh, Dr. Cliff, uh, do you have some uh, parting uh, uh, comments to make uh, on uh, just, Mr. Samir Unhale's uh, remarks? Very, very short bullets. One, uh, just to be clear, the book is out. Yes. yes. Um, okay. And, and uh, so please go, go for it. And uh, no, number two, uh, that I think that comment about science and math not being in many schools, maybe this is the mechanism to introduce science and math. So many people who grow up to be scientists, engineers, astronauts, or whatever, talk about that one moment that inspired them. It didn't have to be a full course. It was something about it they loved. Uh, and final comment, uh, yes, our settings are very different, but don't copy models, apply principles. And I hope you all have taken some principles away that you can take back and assess critically in your settings and apply them. Professors, doctors, Participants, thank you all for the invite. Thank you, Cliff. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks thank a lot. you very much. Thank you very much. Have a very good good day to you, Cliff. And uh, good evening, sir. Professor Sina, thank, thank you again. Thank you. I would thank say good evening to you all. Yes. Such is a good night. <laughs> yes. Good night. <laughs> yes. Have a nice day. Dr. Thank you. There was Take one care. question Bye. that we should have a longer uh, uh, for a, uh, discussing the tools. Uh, in greater detail, uh, I would say that uh, uh, let us work more towards this and uh, given the right time and right audience so that there is a lot of participation and uh, Dr. Sina can also uh, participate or chair uh, so that more okay. detail we can all learn and understand. Uh, but yes, sure. uh, we will prepare for it uh, more strongly so that we have sure. more practitioners also uh, around and, to help us. And, sure. and, let me, and let me let me emphasize there, I, you know, if, if the value in this is the ideas that people took away and that's where the value is, wonderful. I, 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 I don't uh, hmm. ha have any need to, to push uh, doing a 
small session or workshop around the tools. I simply wanted to make it available because I, I don't like the idea of uh, sharing these ideas and then folks either um, have to spend a lot of money or, or a lot of time trying to find the, the materials. So um, they'll do what the That's uh, market, dema market demand, right, Semi? <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Exactly. And we wish you a very well 2021. Looking yeah. forward to for America. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all. And yeah. a better time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Bye, you. Sir. Okay. Bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.